Are you able to click and drag any further? It doesn't show up on the Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, the local thing today is uh, Charlie Kilpatrick from Northwestern. Uh, Charlie uh, did his uh, undergraduate work in Tata before moving to the University of Arizona, where he worked with George Wheatley doing some limited studies of theory and organic theory around the global uh, From there, he moved to UC Santa Cruz, working with Professor Ryan Foley. Uh, on a whole bunch of other stuff, and now he's a Sierra fellow, uh, though not a whole lot long, uh, and Northwestern working with Andre Fong, uh, he did his PhD in Sierra Nevada, and now he's a Sierra fellow at Northwestern. Uh, and Charlie is a graduate student of the Center for Biology and Biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Charlie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Kilpatrick. I'm a graduate student in Sierra Nevada. I'm working on the Center for Biology and Biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. I'm working on the Center for Biology and Biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. I'm working on the Center for Biology and Biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. I'm working on the Center for Biology and Biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. I'm working on the Center for Right. Thank you so much, Gotham, and thank you to everybody here for inviting me and all the great conversations that I've had. And really good visiting UIUC, and yeah, I'll to come back here soon from Chicago. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking uh, a lot about my work on core collapse supernovae and massive stars. Uh, really, sort of the culmination of what I've been doing over the past sort of seven years um, since I really started working on extragalactic transients and massive stars, and really what we've learned about the connection between uh, massive stars and how they evolve and eventually exploded for collapse supernovae. Okay, uh, so actually when I was uh, an undergraduate uh, at Caltech, I also majored in, in history, uh, and I've been very interested in, in sort of the history of astronomy and how do we know what we know today about uh, stars, supernovae, and other explosions. And supernovae have really always been at the cutting edge of time domain astronomy and astronomy in general. Um, I don't think Gotham and I would be here today talking about time domain astronomy and transients without 87A, which, which kickstarted uh, really what I'm going to be talking about today, the connection between massive stars and transients but also the study of, of transients in general, leading to uh, type 1A studies and the uh, dark energy um, and the wide field surveys that we currently have and, and are studying today. Uh, and we really owe that um, in part to uh, Fritz Wicke and the survey that he conducted in the mid 20th century, uh, which is one of the templates that we have for, for time domain astronomy and observing galaxies and their stellar explosions. Uh, and of course, even going back further, uh, observations historically have been really informed us about uh, where uh, the universe is changing, that we don't live in a static and unchanging universe. Uh, but these observations, including of the Crab Nebula uh, and historical observations of when it exploded and how bright it was, are still informing our understanding of, of massive stars and evolution uh, and supernovae today. So I, I stole this slide from Gotham, uh, and I heard he used it in his uh, colloquium last week. Uh, but I really liked uh, this figure, and so I adapted it. Uh, but uh, if you study any aspect of astronomy, uh, you and I will ha have something to talk about in terms of the exploding stars and how they connect to all areas of astronomy. Uh, I care about metal enrichment. I study gravitational waves. Uh, I care a lot about nuclear physics and the R process and, and where uh, heavy elements come from. I care about stellar evolution, obviously. Uh, anything that anybody is doing here today directly connects, uh, including what Gotham is doing. It's so just embarrassing. I stole it from Ryan Foley, and then I found out Ryan Foley stole it from Bob Kirshner. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this, this figure, which yeah, actually this is an original version that I created just for this talk, has, <laughs> has a long and history uh, lineage, uh, but this is specific to massive stars and exploding massive stars. So uh, I can at least claim some credit for that. Um, but the point is, uh, you all should care about uh, 
time domain astronomy and really uh, the new insight that we're going to have in the near future uh, into exploding massive stars and uh, what we're going to observe across the universe. Uh, and that's because the next 10 and 20 years uh, are going to be uh, revolutionary, really, not just uh, for exploding massive stars, but for time domain astronomy in general. Uh, we're getting new and exciting uh, electromagnetic capabilities, of course, with the Rubin Observatory and major surveys like that, uh, but also with Roman, uh, with StarX, uh, with other uh, new facilities that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, theory has really taken off. I, I can remember when I was in graduate school 10 years ago, uh, we still did not have working 3D models of core collapse supernova uh, explosions. They just wouldn't explode right. Uh, and nowadays, um, uh, uh, people in uh, Germany and other places have been able to create uh, working 3D models of these explosions uh, from fundamental physics showing that these explosions work via the neutrino mechanism and mapping to the massive stars uh, that they come from. And of course, now with multi-messenger observations uh, with new, the neutrinos, which started with 87A, uh, there's going to be an exciting time in the next 10 to 20 years connecting all of these pieces uh, and better understanding the pathways through which stars explode uh, and die and create the supernovae that we observe across the universe. Uh, so just sort of connecting uh, this whole picture together, there's multiple areas of time domain astrophysics that I and people like Gotham and others study. Um, I'm very interested in the progenitor stars, uh, where stars come from, how they eventually collapse in on themselves and either do produce supernovae or don't. Uh, and that's a large part of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the Young Supernova Experiment and the surveys that I'm a part of are very interested in this, pushing observations back further and further right to the time of core collapse uh, and trying to isolate exactly where this line occurs. Uh, where a star starts to collapse and then eventually explodes and produces the luminous transient that we see. Uh, and then, of course, major surveys are really going to clean up here in the future, studying uh, supernovae all across the universe, uh, their explosion properties, whether they're interacting with circumstellar matter, and, of course, their host galaxy. Uh, and so just to sort of summarize, um, you can also think about this, this sort of plot, even though it maps in time, uh, we can only really do the science for the very closest stars within about 40 megaparsecs uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, currently, the Young Supernova Experiment is doing this uh, with early observations, mostly in the local universe. Uh, but we do have observations of supernovae uh, out to sort of intermediate redshifts, not quite high redshifts. Uh, but we're going to be pushing that further and further with Rubin Observatory. And so yet another way to think about this is that Rubin is really going to clean up at, at this. Um, it's going to push the volume of the universe where we can probe massive star explosions out further and further. And so Rubin is just going to annihilate all previous surveys in terms of quantity. Pick any class of supernova and we'll have more uh, examples of that class in the first year of a Rubin observations than we'll have had uh, in all previous years from all other optical surveys. Uh, so we'll be able to do this amazing science just with uh, orders of magnitude larger samples of objects. Uh, but what I want to argue today and in my talk and demonstrate to you is that Rubin is also going to be excellent in terms of the quality of observations that we'll have for these other types of, of science. Uh, Rubin is going to provide detailed imaging of nearby galaxies where we'll, we'll be able to study the progenitors of supernovae. And by using deep observations and combining with other surveys, we'll have an unprecedented quality in terms of the history of certain positions on the sky where we can probe new explosions uh, and see the very interesting physics uh, that happens when massive stars collapse in on the belt and eventually explode. So uh, I've been talking about massive star explosions and, and haven't really uh, set up the stage yet uh, for what I'm going to be discussing. Of course, uh, this being an astronomy department, I'm sure all of you learned in uh, your stellar astrophysics class that core collapse happens for stars roughly eight to uh, 100 solar masses. Uh, even though stars more massive than about this uh, do likely explode as supernovae and will be very important for Rubin discovered supernovae and Roman discovered supernovae, uh, the mechanism is probably slightly different, and these stars are exceedingly rare. Uh, so even though these likely affect the early universe, uh, the stars that I'm going to be talking about today 
uh, in large part are closer to eight solar masses, but extend uh, in roughly this mass range. And of course, these stars have a shell-like structure with a massive extended hydrogen envelope for the most part uh, that might be shedded over time, uh, but with increasing mass elements for the center of the star uh, to an inert iron core that eventually collapses in on itself and through, we think, through a neutrino mechanism, uh, explodes the star by generating uh, 10 to the 53 ergs of neutrinos, some of which are deposited into the outer layers of the star. So when I say core collapse supernova, uh, this is what I'm referring to, uh, and this is roughly the massive range, math range of the stars uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. So I mentioned that the science of connecting massive star explosions to supernovae really started with 1987A. Uh, and the way that the science works is we see supernovae go off on the sky, including 87A in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which was spotted by a Chilean astronomer in February of 1987. Uh, and we go back into archival imaging and try to identify the star that exploded, uh, which in this case was a blue supergiant star, Sand Lake 69, initially misidentified by Bob Kirchner, uh, but eventually uh, the, with detailed imaging and precise alignment, uh, we were able to find the right star. Uh, but this really uh, set up a whole new area of science uh, and taught us a lot of lessons not just about the peculiar kinds of stars and stellar evolutionary pathways that can produce these supernovae, uh, but how to do uh, the science very accurately. So in general, um, the massive stars that exploded different types of supernovae, uh, red supergiants dominate this population. They're the most common type of evolved uh, massive star above eight solar masses. And we now firmly know that they explode as hydrogen-rich supernovae. So when I say type 2, I'm talking about uh, supernovae with lots of hydrogen. Uh, we have one example in ID 87A of a blue supergiant star exploding again as a peculiar type of type 2 supernova. And we have a few examples, although these might not be terminal explosions, of very extremely high mass stars, uh, yellow and, and blue hypergiants, uh, and luminous blue variable, similar to Eta Carr, that explode as type 2N supernovae, uh, which I won't touch on a whole lot today. Uh, but there's still a big mystery, and in particular, having to do with mass loss of these more stripped stars, uh, which we think produce stripped envelope supernovae, so stars with decreasing amounts of hydrogen in their atmospheres, or even no hydrogen or helium. Uh, it's still a big mystery. How do these stars lose their outer envelopes uh, over their evolution, either due to the winds or eruptions or binary uh, evolution with road flow, boker flow? Uh, and how do they eventually explode? In what state are they? Uh, are they wolf rayet stars or helium stars or what? So the majority of what I'm going to be talking about today uh, deals with this sort of conundrum that as stars evolve and become more massive, uh, we think they end up more stripped uh, at the ends of their lives and produce, we think, uh, this sort of continuum from very hydrogen rich to more depleted supernovae uh, that we've seen uh, in abundance in other galaxies. So I mentioned with, with 87A, but uh, in detail, uh, really the way that this works, uh, again, is uh, we have supernovae that go off in other galaxies, and sometimes we're lucky enough to have very deep archival, usually HST imaging. Uh, this can be done with ground-based imaging, too, as with 87A and a few other examples, uh, and as I'm hoping to do in the future with Rubin data. Uh, but in general, the vast majority of events that we have where we can see a progenitor star like this one are in HST data. Uh, and we usually need very high-resolution imaging of the supernova itself to precisely align to the archival imaging and identify in that imaging where the progenitor star is. Uh, and that's because these stars tend to explode in very crowded environments or even uh, partly blended uh, with nearby stars. And so uh, confusion and uh, mistaking nearby stars for the progenitor is often a big problem. Uh, and partly the way that we solve that is by saying uh, you have to go back years later and identify that the stars disappeared. Uh, so this was done for 2008 BK, a type two supernova in this galaxy where we have the progenitor star identification at A, B is the supernova explosion, and C is years later, or roughly two years later, uh, the star disappeared in follow-up HST imaging. Uh, so this is really the gold standard for how this science is done. 
but with a recent accounting, I went back into the literature and, and really looked at all the, the highly uh, likely examples or confirmed examples of progenitor stars. We have roughly two dozen supernovae from red supergiants that exploded as hydrogen-rich supernovae, uh, five from these hydrogen-4 supernovae, and two from hydrogen-3. So that's the entire landscape up to the present date of all of these supernova progenitor identifications uh, from the, the sort of panoply of papers and references therein. Um, and that's you know all we know uh, about directly identified progenitors uh, right now. So what is that overall population taught us? So the first, uh, just going to the biggest population of these stars uh, is the hydrogen rich or type two supernovae from these red supergiant progenitors uh, lying on the red supergiant branch from eight to about 20 solar masses. And so immediately there, uh, there's sort of a conflict between what we understand about stellar evolution and what we see from these supernovae and direct imaging. And that's because uh, the highest mass red supergiant that you can have just in situ at the end of its life uh, evolves right up to about the Humphreys and Davidson limit. Uh, so this is about where the star will become Eddington limited. If you look at the HR diagram, there are no stars in this region. And that's because if a star were that luminous, it would be above the Eddington luminosity. Uh, and it would start to shed its mass and evolve blueward as it strips its envelope. Um, and so the highest uh, luminosity progenitor for a type two supernova doesn't extend quite up to this luminosity. You would expect to see stars between about 20 and 30 solar masses uh, that are exploding as type two supernovae due to the number that we have. And just going statistically by sort of a saltpeter initial mass function, uh, but we don't see them. So to put uh, sort of that visually uh, to demonstrate that, uh, this is from a paper that I wrote uh, with Jason Vasquez, uh, looking at in particular at the star uh, from 2019 MHM, a nearby supernova, and plotting all of the uh, directly identified progenitors that we have. And if you just plot via saltpeter IMF, they seem to cut off at about 21 solar masses. Whereas there are red supergiants in our galaxy and directly identified in other galaxies that extend up to about 30 solar masses. So statistically, this is a huge problem. There's a direct conflict just saying that we would expect to see, you know, a 25 or 28 solar mass star, a red supergiant exploding as a type two supernova, and we just don't see that. Uh, and so the big question and something that I've been pursuing lately is, is this just an observational bias? Is there some other reason in the data, something that we've misinterpreted or some other expectation that we have uh, that doesn't match uh, what we're actually seeing? Or is this a real physical effect where these higher mass stars up to about 30 solar masses don't explode as type two supernovae? Uh, so to phrase that in another way, there could sort of be two explanations for why high mass red supergiants don't explode as hydrogen rich supernovae. One is intrinsic, uh, and this is actually very uh, well supported or at least partly supported by the fact that we have observed a 25 solar mass red supergiant that just disappeared uh, in this galaxy NGC 6946, suggesting that maybe it collapsed directly into a black hole or maybe it's just undergoing some extreme form of variability or, or dust formation in its environment, and it's just completely extinguished, and we wouldn't expect to see it in the optical anymore. So there are actually JWST observations scheduled, uh, and I know some of which have actually been taken to observe this star again and try to identify if it is just a very heavily dust obscured star. Uh, but if that's not the case, then it's probably the best example that we have of what's called a failed supernova. So something that used to be a high mass star and a collapsed in on itself into a black hole, maybe with a very low luminosity red transient uh, due to its outer envelope being ejected off. So this is something I'm very excited to look in Rubin and Roman data in the future to try to identify more of these examples and see if we can place a rate constraint on failed supernovae. Uh, but the other explanation for the red supergiant problem is maybe that there's this observational bias. So our data for these stars that we see in pre-explosion imaging uh, it doesn't have the best uh, time constraint. We don't have light curves like we do of Betelgeuse, where it's extremely variable over long time scales. Uh, it's not always uh, sampling its full SED out to the infrared, where we can see extreme changes in the spectral energy distribution. 
And so one hypothesis is that we're underestimating the masses and luminosities of these stars in free explosion imaging. And there really is no statistical conflict between the saltpeter IMF and the distribution of stars that we see in free explosion imaging. So what have we learned uh, since about 2015 when this problem was originally pointed out uh, by Stephen Smart? Well, we've been lucky enough uh, over time to be able to better sample the SEDs of a lot of red supergiants, including in our own galaxy. Uh, and we know that they have these very dusty nebulae around them. Uh, so if we don't have optical data, or if we don't have infrared data and just optical data constraining that stellar part of their SED, they could be highly dust obscured and we would severely underestimate their total luminosity. So we really need constraints at JWST wavelengths or, or Spitzer wavelengths of the SEDs of these stars uh, out into the mid-infrared where we can sample their full bolometric luminosity and better understand uh, what exactly they're doing before they explode. So that's what we did uh, in 2018 uh, where Ryan Foley and I identified a red supergiant star in the same fireworks galaxy, NGC 6946, where we were able to constrain its full SED, uh, including with Spitzer data, out to the mid-infrared at about five microns. And developing this new model, uh, Ryan and I modeled it as sort of a normal red supergiant, but with circumstellar extinction uh, re-emitting at these infrared wavelengths. And the really interesting thing is that if we only had this blue optical data, which about 90% of the type two supernova progenitors uh, only have these bands where they've been identified, uh, we would significantly underestimate the total luminosity. So I'm really looking forward to an era where uh, JWST imaging and Roman imaging make uh, readily available all of these data uh, that we really need to sample the peak of their distributions as well as identify uh, in more extreme types of dust, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, that might be around these, these massive stars uh, as we're learning more and more that uh, a lot of them do uh, have. So for this particular example, uh, without the near and mid infrared constraints, we estimated that we would underestimate the, the luminosity by about 10 to 60%, which would ease some of the tension with the red supergiant problem if we applied it to every other uh, star where these data aren't available. But really, in order to, to understand that, we need to know the full spectral energy distribution of all type 2 supernova progenitors uh, and be able to accurately create models that we can apply as an ensemble to other types of, of supernovae where these data aren't available. Um, yeah. Uh, so for Roman, you don't actually need time series data for this, right? You just need a single pass in the IR. So you can do this from the, the wide area survey rather than the time domain. So you, you don't necessarily need the light curves if you don't expect that they're extremely variable. Yeah. Um, we did this from a single epoch where uh, there were contemporaneous optical and uh, IR observations. Uh, out to Spitzer wavelengths. Uh, there were only three epochs for this particular source where there were contemporaneous optical and infrared. Uh, but as we'll get to in a minute, there, there are some examples where they are extremely variable uh, pre-explosion uh, and where it would be very, very helpful to have the full time series uh, to be able to say it's sort of what the average um, infrared emission is. Charlie, could you just tell the closed capture image there? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Uh, there are other ways to do this, though. So, uh, as I'll get to sort of at the end of the talk, there are many other initial math indicators uh, that we can use to compare to these stars and be able to say are our pre explosion masses matching what we expect from, uh, from other estimates. So in particular, the very early parts of the light curves of some supernovae and print information um, about the radius of that star, uh, which because the red supergiant branch is just a very linear branch, you can sort of map the radius of the star back onto the luminosity or the mass um, and be able to say, is this consistent with what I'm finding in, in pre-explosion data? Uh, we can also use nebular spectroscopy. So this oxygen one line is, is a forbidden line at about 6,300 angstroms and maps to the oxygen core mass of the star that exploded, uh, which you can use again to say something about the initial mass of that star. And in the examples where we have uh, 
uh, both of these indicators, as well as pre-explosion data, there seems to be an inconsistency between the mass of the star from the pre-explosion data and the post-explosion observations. Uh, so these are both from a paper that I wrote on one example uh, where the pre-explosion data seemed to indicate a much lower mass star than we got from post-explosion follow-up. Uh, but this has been seen in a lot of other cases in literature. Uh, so all of this, I think, is pointing to the fact uh, that these stars are significantly reddened and extinguished, uh, and we really need the multi-wavelength data out into the mid-infrared to be able to say exactly what the masses of these stars are. Uh, and this is something I'm, I'm also looking forward to doing with sort of an ensemble of supernovae where we can apply these um, either very early light curve constraints or late time uh, nebular spectroscopy as I'm collecting with Keck at Northwestern uh, and see if the, uh, the initial masses that we infer from these indicators are consistent with a Sol Peter IMF up to about 30 solar masses. Uh, but as uh, I sort of alluded to with Gotham, uh, every once in a while, we get these very exceptional cases uh, where there are mid-infrared constraints um, uh, and even with multi-epic uh, and, and multi-wavelength data. So uh, just a few months ago, uh, this very nearby supernova 23IXF exploded in M101. It was the closest uh, and brightest core collapse supernova in about 10 years, going back, I think, to 2011 BH. Um, but this is a very exciting source, not just from the pre-explosion uh, observation uh, uh, side, but because we were able to get such excellent follow-up data, including with the young supernova experiment. Uh, but of course, I was mostly interested in the source because there were such uh, excellent HST and even ground-based data. Uh, so the, this uh, image right here is from Gemini and K-band, uh, really nicely constraining the peak of the SED of this source. Uh, as well as Spitzer data, where there was a booming mid-infrared observation uh, showing that the source uh, was uh, still bright in Spitzer data many decades before it exploded. Uh, but in general, this indicated an extremely red source um, that was partly blended, but we were able to nicely separate all the emission out uh, and get a very beautiful SED, uh, which is right here. Uh, so we were able to apply the same model uh, that I showed before for 2017 EAW to this source. And uh, the amount of reddening that it exhibited was huge, uh, orders of magnitude higher than what we saw for 2017 EAW with about five magnitudes of extinction, uh, which you can sort of see here, this is uh, the observation of the SED uh, and I band roughly. And you, all the way up here is the model prediction for what the unextinguished SED would look like if we just had a normal red supergiant uh, not being uh, obscured by the dust shell. Um, so this is uh, really exciting, not just because we were able to so nicely constrain exactly what the star looked like uh, years and even decades before it exploded, uh, but it was also indicative of extremely high mass loss. So where did all this material come from? Where did the dust and circumstellar matter originate from that produced uh, all of this uh, dust extinction. This is still sort of an open question and something that we're hoping uh, to be able to answer in better detail as we continue to observe this source. Um, it's, I think, behind the sun right now, uh, but we're going to be doing that in, in about a moment. Charlie? But, oh, yep. Yeah, oh, thanks. Um, sorry to interrupt, but um, that's really cool. So, um, uh, when you get a sense of the extinction like this, can you make an estimate of the amount of dust you need to uh, to create that? Yeah, so um, it, it's in the paper. Um, the, the main uncertainty uh, in the dust extinction measurement is the velocity of the wind that produced it. Uh, although we can partly get that from high resolution spectra of uh, 23IXF itself. So. Uh, the supernova light irradiates the, the hydrogen-rich material uh, that, that's entrained with the dust um, around the supernova, and you get the velocity width of the wind, which is, I think, about 10 or 20 kilometers per second. Uh, and so if you incorporate that, you need a mass loss rate of about 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year to produce that amount of dust. Um, I forget off the top of my head what that translates to in terms of the dust mass, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's also in the paper. Cool, thanks. So maybe even more exciting than that, 
um, is how extremely variable this source was uh, in the years before explosion. So this is infrared data again, uh, showing sort of the really genes tail of that, that dust uh, black body profile that we fit uh, with these bars indicating the average luminosity. And this is compared to Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is probably even more massive uh, than the star was at the time that it exploded. Uh, but this star is an, uh, a factor of a few more variable in the infrared um, than, uh, than Betelgeuse is at roughly the same wavelength. Uh, and so this is really exciting just from this sort of mass loss perspective, uh, this periodicity with about a 2.8 year time scale, I think, um, is consistent with sort of normal modes of red supergiant variability. This, this is very common, uh, this type of time scale, anywhere from about one to maybe eight years. Uh, but we've never seen something quite this variable uh, right before it exploded. Um, and so is this uh, indicative of, of some sort of unusual mode of mass loss? Um, is this being powered by something deep in the core of the star, or maybe a binary companion? Uh, I think that's still an open question, but something that we're uh, also hoping to answer in more detail as we get uh, additional follow-up of 23IXF. Um, and this, this variability has been confirmed uh, by several other papers um, in the literature. Uh, just showing that it had a very interesting infrared photosphere uh, at these times. So one of the hypotheses that, that we put forward in our paper about why exactly this is happening has to do with what these massive stars are doing right before they explode. So on a time scale of about 10 years before explosion is when you enter the later burning stages, so off-center oxygen burning, and eventually um, uh, deeper toward the core, um, where you get oxygen and silicon burning, uh, in sort of the final days and years before explosion. Um, and these processes are extremely temperature sensitive and so can cause the star to become slightly unstable um, and sort of pop up and contract uh, as we see in a lot of other massive stars that are close to the Eddington lim limit. So this is about where 23IXF was observed, um, right in, in sort of this phase where these later burning stages are turning on and picking up the neutrino luminosity and the amount of energy generated in the core. Uh, so we think, um, and this is right about the mass of, that we predicted for 23IXF, that this could be uh, causing the, this mode of variability, although we've never exactly seen this type of variability for other stars um, of a similar type uh, and mass in pre-explosion data, even though the other example that I showed, 17 EAW, had similar Spitzer constraints uh, pre-explosion. We have, however, seen evidence for certain types of outbursts and more eruptive or explosive variability on time scales of days before explosion. So this is a very exciting uh, young supernova experiment constraint by Wynne Jacobson Galan uh, from last year, where we detected uh, in sort of the R and I bands um, a source at the location of a type two supernova roughly 80 days uh, before core collapse. So these pre-explosion observations, oh, yeah. So the, the Spitzer data you showed were not really intended to detect the type of storms. It just happened to be. Yeah, that was completely serendipitous. Um, it, they were intended to detect uh, infrared variables. So it's from uh, Nancy Codleywall's uh, program Spirits on Spitzer that roughly every 180 days, they observed uh, a whole range of galaxies at sort of 10 to 20 megaparsecs, including M101 and NGC 6946. Um, so they've looked for, for variables that are similar to this in terms of luminosity and, and amplitude and everything. But this is sort of a rare type of, of infrared variable, especially um, at this luminosity range. Uh, it, it's a lot less luminous in the infrared actually than uh, some of the more extreme LBB-like variables that they've seen. It, it basically escaped notice until after. Yeah, so that, that's a big question is, uh, can we identify these types of sources a priori and, and something that we're actually looking at in, in Nancy uh, Spirits data now to see if there are other analogs to this that we can follow up maybe with JWST or ground-based telescopes uh, and sort of detecting uh, a, a sort of explosion imminent uh, scenario. Um, but these other sorts of precursors that are also visible in the optical, including by Rubin, 
I think are really exciting for uh, exactly the, this kind of scenario that, that we're hoping to find where if you have a low luminosity precursor, uh, maybe it's consistent with the location of a massive star, uh, we would be able to put it slip down on a source like this and look at exactly what it's doing, what its spectral type is, uh, maybe even if it has a companion, if we have a deep uh, blue optical and UV imaging at that site before explosion. So I think this is a really promising uh, way forward, um, maybe even more promising than, than neutrinos, at least for right now, to be able to say if the core collapse of a massive star is going to happen in the near future. Uh, but something that I'm very interested in pursuing uh, with Rubin data uh, and Roman in the near future. Yeah. We have a question from the digital audience. Um, so in the plot before this, that had the 2023 supernova, is that basically like had way more uh, energy than expected? Is the gray line what's expected? So the, the energy in the core, this is just a model from uh, Stan Woosley and Alex Eager um, for a, a star roughly at this mass. So this is exactly what's expected for all stars at this mass. I think it, it's still a big open question why we don't see this more often. Um, it might just be the quality of data since this was so nearby and we were lucky enough to have epics and epics of, of Spitzer data. Um, but I think at least for 2017 EAW and, and one or two others, we can say that this level of variability did not occur for stars of similar masses on similar time scales before explosion. Okay. So, oh, please go ahead. so the fact that it's like the black line is so different from the gray line could just be because we have more data? Oh, so the, the black and the gray line are, are actually, this is uh, the nuclear energy um, in the core of the star. And then this is, uh, yeah, the, the total nuclear energy versus the nuclear energy generation rate. This is this is just in the Wisley and Peter paper. Um, all I'm showing is that the time scale for the observations that we had of 23 IXF were similar to the time scale where these types of burning processes turn on in the core of the star. Okay. Okay, so it's two different things. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, but. Another really big uh, open question and something that I think is, is more possible to observe with large numbers of supernovae in the near future is how common this, this density of mass is in the immediate environment of the stars. So I pointed to a lot of lines of evidence showing that there are probably these very dense shells of material immediately around red supergiants when they explode. Uh, my Again, my colleague, Wynne jacobson Golan showed this for 2020 PLF, the one with the uh, pre-explosion outburst. Uh, this is a whole field of, of supernova follow-up called flash spectroscopy, where we see evidence for the shock interaction between the supernova and its circumstellar environment, producing these very high ionization lines uh, in the winds and, and circumstellar matter around, around these stars. Uh, but really, we want to know how common this is and whether it's a function of just the initial mass of the star and its late stage burning processes like I was talking about, or maybe something more complicated like metallicity driving a stronger radiative winds or interaction with the companion. Uh, but guaranteeing these very early observations right after the star goes off because this material is confined so close to the progenitor star is essential in order to be able to understand the diversity of these explosions and they, how they correlate with all these different parameters. So uh, I'm going to just uh, briefly go over uh, the stripped envelope supernovae. And as you get more stripped uh, and remove a lot of the hydrogen from these stars, uh, what exactly happens to their progenitors and what exactly is driving this mass loss uh, long before the supernova happens that you can deplete all the hydrogen and sometimes helium out of these stars uh, before they explode. So I'm going to highlight just two examples uh, of hydrogen uh, depleted supernovae. So these are called pipe 1Bs. Uh, and there are only two examples right now in the literature uh, with uh, supernova progenitor candidates. Uh, this one for IPTF 13 BBN has been confirmed 
but this is a very interesting example on the polar opposite end of the HR diagram, uh, albeit at a similar luminosity uh, for 2019 YBR. So uh, two lines of evidence, I think, point to uh, what exactly is happening with mass loss in these stars, uh, what's driving it, um, and how exactly uh, is mass loss timed before the, the supernova explosion happens uh, such that you can get these stripped envelope supernovae like type 1 Ds. Uh, so one is from this paper by Raf Margudi, where she looked at uh, a lot of radio observation of stripped envelope supernovae showing that as you go through a few years after explosion, almost all of them are interacting with their circumstellar environment. So radio detection is pretty much proof positive of dense circumstellar matter in supernovae. Uh, and she sees this for more than half of supernovae at about two years uh, after explosion. Another and a really interesting new program from Ori Fox at Space Telescope goes back uh, and looks at the sites of stripped envelope supernovae years after they explode uh, with deep ultraviolet imaging. And he's been able to find in a couple of cases uh, for O1IG and 13GE that there are surviving companion stars. So I think all of this points to prompt mass loss before explosion at around 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus five solar masses per year. And this is probably driven by a close binary companion star that's still on the main sequence, that's why they're very uh, UV bright, uh, but that's evolving behind the primary star uh, and stripping mass from that star in order to uh, get rid of the envelope in time for explosion. So just to get back uh, to 2019 YVR, um, this was a very normal looking type 1b supernovae for the most part in this galaxy NGC 69, or 4666. Um, it had a very normal light curve, uh, typical of all type 1b supernovae. And maybe even more interestingly, it was essentially a spectroscopic twin for that other uh, supernova IPTF 13 BVN uh, that I showed you earlier that also had a progenitor star detection. Uh, so if I just overlay the two spectra uh, corrected for extinction to the host galaxy, they're essentially identical at similar phases. Um, so this is pointing, I think, uh, or you would expect, uh, to a very stripped helium star, uh, which was actually directly observed for IPTF 13 BBN, a very hot blue star that no longer has its hydrogen envelope, um, but that isn't what we saw. So in this galaxy, NGC 4666, we were lucky enough to have HST imaging, where we directly identified a progenitor star right here, uh, using actually Gemini imaging uh, with adaptive optics to very precisely align the two, and we found a very red star. So this is uh, not at all what you would expect uh, for the progenitor of something that has no hydrogen in its envelope. Basically, in order to get an F star or something sort of a yellow super giant-ish, you need an inflated hydrogen envelope in order to explain these very red colors. Basically, the core of the star is hot and blue, and in order to mask out that light, you need an extended envelope that, that normally has a lot of hydrogen in it uh, to explain all of this. Another really interesting piece of evidence that points to what I think is going on in, in 19 YBR, although we haven't fully explained it yet, is a strong circumstellar interaction uh, shortly after explosion. So I showed you that plot from Rath Marduti, uh, but here we see it in the optical, uh, in this H-alpha line, uh, in the X-ray, and also in the radio, there's strong circumstellar interaction within about six months from explosion. Uh, so only about 10 to 20% of stripped envelope supernovae have these, this interaction on uh, such short time scales, uh, but I think this is pointing to a very recently ejected envelope. Uh, and something uh, very energetic and dynamic that's going on in this progenitor system. So two explanations that we came up with to sort of explain all this is a very recent LBB-like eruption. So like Eta Carina, uh, certain stars uh, periodically erupt. Uh, in Eta Carina, it could be due to interaction with a companion, or it's again, something happening in the core of that star or possibly a common envelope evolution. So I mentioned close interaction with a binary companion explains a lot of type 1b supernovae. Uh, but I think in this case, uh, the, the uh, close interaction between the primary star and its uh, companion inflated the envelope and eject part of it, and it hasn't had time to radiatively relax 
back to a state uh, where we would expect a very blue, uh, hot looking envelope. Um, so we do have uh, approved cycle 31 HST observations that I think will shed some more light on exactly what's happening and whether the progenitor candidate actually disappeared. But this is still sort of an open question, what exactly is happening uh, in this system? Uh, so finally, just for uh, supernova progenitors, uh, most stars don't live in this area of the HR diagram uh, called the Hertzsprung gap. Um, but we've already found a handful of progenitor stars uh, that live here with these hydrogen depleted supernovae or, or type 2 Bs. Uh, so this is still sort of an open question. Uh, how do you efficiently strip the star and how much hydrogen can be left over uh, before a type 2b, something that's sort of transitional between the type 2s and 1b's, um, goes from one to the other. Uh, so this is from a paper uh, by Danny Milosalovic just showing that even though the early observations, they probe sort of the total nickel production and the ejecta mass from the supernova, you really need these very early observations of the supernova to be able to tightly constrain the radius of the progenitor star in a closed circumstellar matter and identify uh, exactly what's happening in the supernova promptly before explosion, where some of these uh, more extended sources might have inflated hydrogen envelopes, whereas there appears to be a population of compact sources that are more efficiently depleted uh, that ex can explain why su supernova a transition from 2b to 1b. And historically, we've been able to do this uh, just by getting very lucky um, with very unique constraints on the very early time data in supernovae. So this is from uh, one of my favorite optics, 2016 GKG, a Chilean astronomer uh, actually took these images right here of a galaxy NGC 613. Uh, right as he was setting up his camera uh, and was able to get some of the earliest observations of a supernova, literally minutes after it exploded uh, and very nicely constrained the radius of the progenitor star. Uh, but this was entirely luck. I, I don't think we can uh, rely on Chilean astronomers buying the cameras and setting them up right at a galaxy right as the supernova is exploding. And so even though this was very exciting and something that I was uh, uh, more than enthused to work on, we really need to be able to guarantee these uh, very early observations quickly on a supernova uh, right after they explode. So how are we gonna do that in the near future? Well, LSST is going to be great, but it's not necessarily going to help with this problem. Even with the rolling cadence, we'll get nicely sampled light curves for type 1As and the like, but we're really probing the earliest time scales when supernovae are the faintest, uh, in order to address these, these infant supernova questions uh, about what exactly the star looks like and what it's doing immediately before explosion. Uh, so there's multiple solutions to this. Uh, we can either use very unique data sets and that sort of purpose-built uh, facilities that do one thing very well. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of really excellent astronomers on the Kepler and TESS missions. Uh, which just stare at patches of sky with very high cadence. And every so often, supernovae go off in them, and we're able to get these beautiful light curves. Uh, and so there are obviously trade-offs. Uh, even between Kepler and TESS, uh, there's different fields of view. Um, TESS is not quite as deep as Kepler in general. Uh, there's no color information with these, and so we're not able to get sort of the full bolometric light curves of these sources, even though we're able to get these very nicely sampled uh, light curves. So we've been very lucky to have these data uh, and be able to do excellent science with them, but it's not really addressing all of the issues that we have. So one other solution that I've been working on uh, is with the STARX mission, uh, which as Gotham said is a MIDEX uh, that it, we're proposing for NASA to fund to launch in 2028, um, which will have a very wide field of view X-ray telescope uh, and we think over time, be able to catch about 10 to 20 uh, shot breakouts. So the prompt X-ray emission right after uh, core collapse as these supernovae explode. And so in our detailed calculations, we're able to see that uh, supernovae similar to the shock breakout observed from 2008D um, will be able to catch. Uh, StarX will have onboard software to trigger on them. And we'll be able to find them just by slewing to the source uh, with all of our telescopes on the ground. Uh, once StarX alerts us to, to these types of systems. 
So this is great. Uh, this is exactly the kind of science that I think we need and the type of data that we want to be able to have to answer questions about the, the sort of structure of a star immediately at core collapse. Uh, we were able to say from this that 2008D was a fairly compact star, so a likely stripped envelope. Uh, but this really relies on having purpose-built tools, again, uh, and very expensive NASA facilities uh, to be able to do this kind of science. So the solution that, that I'm really drawn to because it's a more data-driven approach and relies on uh, distributed resources and being able to maximize what we already have is uh, really taking the allocated resources that we already have and combining them in a way uh, that gets the most science done for uh, the limited cost we have uh, in uh, optical surveys right now. Uh, so that's exactly what the Young Supernova experiment is doing by combining uh, multiple optical surveys uh, and spacing them out uh, in terms of hours and days, uh, we're able to find supernovae very quickly after they explode by using the public ZTF data stream and shadowing these observations with the PanSTARRS telescopes in Hawaii to be able to find rapidly rising supernovae. And this really relies on uh, the nice open public surveys that we have that are often funded by the NSF and so have a huge public component. Uh, and with this, EZ has been extremely successful in finding uh, roughly a dozen supernovae or maybe slightly more than that uh, within uh, two days of explosion per month. And even a few, including uh, sources like 20 PLF that were likely uh, within hours of explosion uh, at the time of discovery or, or 20 PNI. Uh, which was another type two supernova in this case. So this is, I think, very exciting and something that's uh, definitely possible to do with Rubin uh, because it'll probe even deeper into this magnitude space and we'll be able to shadow Rubin observations to find sources that are rising uh, and extremely blue soon after explosion. Uh, and so I'm doing exactly that uh, with the LS4 survey, the Lucia Southern Sky Survey, uh, using this great new camera, which is built from uh, old DE cam parts, actually, uh, in Fermilab. Uh, it has a very wide field of view and this unique uh, fixed quadrant pattern uh, in the filters so that we're always observing an I, G, and Z band uh, at any one time. Uh, but we'll be able to uh, survey a huge fraction of the sky every night, roughly one-eighth of the sky, um, and three-quarters of the time will be devoted to an extragalactic survey. Uh, and so I'm the chair of the supernova uh, component of the survey right now. We're planning to commission in uh, January of uh, next year, actually, and uh, planning exactly one of these surveys that interleaves different observations. Uh, so we'll be able to find infant supernovae soon after they explode. Uh, and sort of the name of that survey that we're coming up with is the 2Pi survey, uh, which will operate in the first year of observations, uh, combining VTF and LS4 data streams, uh, but I'm hoping, and, and we're hoping that our first year of observations bears that out, uh, that as we combine multiple data streams, including Atlas, uh, including the data sets that we have uh, from Ultrasat and Euclid and other surveys that are coming up right now, uh, we'll be able to find even younger supernovae and get higher cadence observations soon after explosion uh, in order to probe that progenitor physics. Uh, but in order to do that, actually, can I ask you a dumb question as well? So, oh, yeah. uh, ninety percent of the data, if I remember right, for Madam talk is public from LS4. Yeah. Uh, but who is actually doing this processing to combine the LS4 public data with all the other stream uh, and find objects? We're building our own broker. Uh, talk to Peter. Um, yeah, I. I don't know where it is right now, okay. but um, I'm working on the survey strategy and in, in pipeline side, but the transient pipeline side is Peter's handling that. <laughs> but as Gotham just pointed out, we do need these brokers. Um, Gotham has built a fantastic one that incorporates uh, many different data streams from many different sources. Uh, we have in part our own uh, internal uh, sort of target and observation manager, Easy Peasy, as part of the Easy Survey. Uh, and my sort of dream and the way that I've been using Easy up until now, and I'm hoping we can uh, move forward with um, with LS4 
this is sort of entirely, uh, to borrow something that Gotham mentioned earlier, is sort of a closed loop in terms of ingesting transient data, being able to trigger on them automatically from these data streams, uh, using all of the follow-up resources that we have, including uh, things like StarX um, and telescopes on the ground, uh, and incorporate that data back into our database. So being able to find these, these sources in sort of a more automated way, I think is really ex an excellent way to maximize resources and something that we need to be thinking in more detail about uh, as we have access to sort of this deluge of data uh, that Ruben and LS4 uh, and even Panzerx is giving us right now. Um, this is sort of a huge problem and something that's only going to get worse in the near future um, as, as we uh, have this sort of uh, bounty of riches problem. Uh, so I was actually going to show easy PZ, but I think I'll follow my own uh, conscience and just skip that part and sort of conclude with uh, how do we make the most of uh, these all this this bounty of riches that we have in the Rubin era to better understand massive star evolution, math loss, late stage cell evolution, and core collapse. Well, I think as I mentioned earlier, uh, these detailed multi-band optical light curves of massive stars before they explode are going to tell us a lot about uh, 23IXF like variability, um, outbursts like 20CLF. Uh, for a larger fraction of the universe and with better fidelity than we've ever been able to do in the past. Uh, so this is actually optical data from a, a similar aperture telescope to uh, Rubin, uh, but we're going to have this for thousands and even tens of thousands of stars in the local universe. Uh, but in order to really maximize the science that we do from that, we need access uh, to these unique data streams and creative methods for combining them uh, and I think uh, with resources like StarX, with high cadence light curves, like we're going to get with LS4, and eventually with all the great infrared imaging that we'll have from Ruben, uh, Roman, and JWST, we'll be able to better understand uh, these massive star populations from years before explosion to years afterward. Uh, so I'll just leave my final conclusions up and take any final questions. Um, so I like to say it's like 10 years. So I suspect there'll be a star and then it will blow up and then eventually it'll not be there. Mm -hmm. How long do you have to wait to like go back and check and say, oh, that star is not three more? Well, in principle, with, with one epic of imaging from LSST, we'll of you know, uh, stars in the Southern Hemisphere and Fornax and, and all these great galaxies, we'll be able to say something about uh, the, the population that are eventually going to explode as, as supernovae. Um, of course, the longer the baseline of data goes, the more we can say about variability, about the colors of the star and what that says about dust. Um, so the more data, the better. And really, LSST is going to have an amazing legacy data set um, you know, for, for decades to come. Um, but I think to, for something 23 I accept, like the baseline of the variability was about uh, 2.8 years. So. I think really after the first year of data, we'll be able to go back and look at all the variables and maybe even try to predict some of the stars that, that look like 23 I except it might be about to explode. Hayden and then Spencer. Uh, are there any like, methods to, I guess, try to find these different major stars to like, new supernova exploding data? Is there like, yeah, there's going to be so many that I love this to see. Like, it's not really possible to find the data system from all these new things. Is there a method? Yeah, well, uh, since 23 I accept, we've been trying to do exactly that with, with Spitzer data and saying, was there sort of an uptick in the variability for, for this particular star? It didn't seem so. Um, the amplitude was, was roughly constant. Um, with with other sources that we've seen, they vary some, uh, not quite at that level. Uh, I think sort of the the outbursts that uh, twenty PLF like system had was maybe more of a smoking gun that it was about to explode. Uh, so I, I think that's probably a very promising avenue. But you know, one of the predictions, if this is driven by late stage nuclear burning, is is that the variability should get stronger and stronger as the energy generation in the core 
increases and becomes more temperature sensitive. Um, so I, anything that, that has an increasing amplitude of variability and is consistent with being a massive star, I, I think would be very interesting to follow up. Hand it over to Brian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, Charlie. Um, thanks for your talk. So, uh, so first, just a quick thing. So the you uh, you showed how the, the we have these HST you know uh, pre explosion images and how precious they are in finding these progenitors. Are there any prospects of doing the same thing with JWST? Yeah. So <laughs> the uh, one of the funny things about twenty three IXF is is that there was a JWST image taken of M one hundred one before it exploded, but it was about ten arc seconds off. The, the field of view. And this, this actually happens all the time with HST data too. So you know, sometimes we get very lucky and sometimes we get unlucky. But uh, one of the things that I'm doing with, with easy peasy and, and really the power behind the, this nice transient database is automatically flagging these systems where the pre-explosion data exists. Um, and then I you know send myself emails or reminders whenever a source like that happens. And so we're already incorporating JWST data into the easy PV data model. And it's just a matter of time, I think, before um, we, we get something with that nice coverage out to sort of 10 micron. Cool, very nice. And then just one other thing, something you mentioned kind of briefly about binarity. Um, so, you know, there's this idea that uh, many, if not most massive stars are in binaries and they preferentially want to pair with other massive stars. Um, so for the progenitor data you have, uh, you know, how, how consistent is that picture? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the, I think Max Mo had a, a paper that has like hundreds of citations now in, in 2017 um, that said 80 to 90 percent of all O and B type stars are in binaries, they could be close or wide binaries. So we would predict that these supernova progenitors could also uh, similarly be in binaries. Um, for the type two supernovae, they're, they're the lower mass stars. So it could be that the primary already exploded and there's a neutron star or a black hole there where the star just got kicked away or there was a merger. Um, and the, the merger caused, uh, actually 87A was predicted uh, to have been formed in this, this channel, the blue supergiant. Um, the merger got rid of some of the envelope or, or not. And so there's only one star there. Um, or that it's just a wide binary and the, uh, the companion doesn't affect the evolution of the other star. But I think at least for the systems that Ori Fox is, is following up with HST data, um, the strict envelope systems that probably come from higher mass progenitors. It seems consistent with this uh, picture that we have that almost all of these stars are in binaries and either the higher mass ones or the very close binaries cause strict envelope supernovae. And so, uh, you know, thanks. I know we're at time, so if we do need to go pick up children, that's fine, but otherwise, we'll go to Maggie and then Erica. What's the system going to look like for finding failed supernovae with LSSP? Yeah, so actually this um, survey, there, this image right here uh, on the left-hand side, it's from the survey for nothing run by uh, OSU on the, the large uh, binocular telescope. Uh, and the reason it, it's so exciting is that they're using basically a similar aperture telescope, similar filters to what LSSP is going to observe. Uh, but they have an even lower cadence um, they, they weren't observing quite as large an area of the sky. So I think basically for all of the galaxies in the Southern Hemisphere, we'll be able to apply the methods that they used, which is basically just look for a star like this. This is a massive star, just one massive star. Um, and whenever it disappears, and, and there's basically negative flux that a position after difference imaging, that's a failed supernova candidate. And then you go back and use your multi-band imaging to construct an FED and say, what type of star was it? You know, you request JWST observations and check if there's an infrared counterpart or something. Um, that, that's, I'm very excited uh, for uh, the future when we can do this regularly because we think it should be happening, you know, fairly often in, in these massive spiral galaxies. Okay. I have uh, a very similar question. So with the failed supernova, my understanding is that it is like 10 to 30, so it's kind of a huge range. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm interested to know if we're saying, okay, this might be going on with failed supernovae, or it could be uh, dust obscuration. Mm -hmm. Do we have a good idea how much dust we're talking about here? And if it's like something that we should expect to be that standard? Yeah. So the you do need a, a very large mass of dust, or you just need it to be very asymmetric. And so we see this actually in resolved imaging of, of Betelgeuse. Um, yeah, if you look at, there's this really cool video of it. I, I don't have it at, at 10 microns, I think, um, where you can see like plumes of dust coming off of it. It's one of the few stars that we can actually resolve from the ground. Um, and the, because it, it's at such a far wavelength, you can also see the um, the dust clouds just going off into space um, as they uh, sort of become, get sloughed off from the outer envelope of the star. Um, so it's possible that we just got very unlucky and some large cloud of, of you know molecular material. There's like TIO and the, the atmospheres of these stars um, that can help the dust condense and form a lot of extinction. Um, but I think there's all every possibility that uh, after the PIs of this JWST proposal that went back and observed the star are going to come back and say, you know, there is uh, an infrared counterpart there. Um, and it's just, you know, either at a little luminosity because something weird is happening in the, in the core of the star or, um, you know, it, it's the same luminosity. It's just being re-emitted at, at sort of eight micron. Okay. I'll start again. Okay, so we're gonna meet outside the lobby around 5.30 and figure out where to go to that.